Hello and welcome to another short installment of Conflict on Camera and we are talking about a pretty cool photo of a couple of Germans and I'll let our guest Greg Way explain more. Hello Paul, how are you? I'm very well thank you. So we're going to be talking about this photo here and um, when was it taken? What's the story behind it? How did you get hold of it? Tell me more. Well when I started to research my book it was published in March this year or last year now for those watching I'll put the the link to Greg's book is in the description below and how you can find out more about Greg's research work thank you very much <laughs> when I was researching the book originally in between 1999 and 2006 I by chance corresponded with a, 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 a Falsham Jaeger veteran who lived in Berkshire by the name of uh, Werner Eichler and he'd settled here after the war one of those POWs that came back to the UK to settle down because um, his home was in Russian controlled Germany, in East Germany. So he came back here, settled down, had a family. And um, I just had a single letter from him and he, he, he sent me an anecdote in the letter and a couple of document copies, but the anecdote was quite interesting because it, it sounded like he had an interest in wartime career. The anecdote was, I believe I was one of the last men to get out of the hotel in, in Casino Town on the 18th of May, 1944. I ended up opposite in an ambulance, having my bandages changed together with my first cup of tea and bacon sandwich. So that was the first and only anecdote he gave me. So there was no unit information, no other service information, no, inf you know, no photographs or anything. So I never wrote back for whatever reason I, I got sidetracked. I never wrote back. Then when I started put to get the book together in October 2017, I wrote to all the veterans who were going to feature in the book. And I suppose in the vain hope that they were still alive, but of course, most of them have passed in the meantime. I did, however, get a, a, receive a letter from the daughter of Werner Eichler. And she informed me he'd passed away in March 2014. And she told me she had even accompanied him to Monte Cassino for one of the anniversaries when she was a teenager, but she knew nothing about his service. So I thought, well, if I can research something about her father and present to her and her brother something about the, her, his wartime service that it might have, you know, a bit of closure for them. So she sent me, she was kind enough to send me his photograph album, a copy of his photograph album, which was very interesting because I didn't know he had any photographs, but yeah, he did. And she sent me quite a few. And that's when I started to research her father's service. I wrote to the Bundes archive as well to request his records uh, for me personally and on behalf of the daughter which took about 18 months to come back, mind. But I began with the photographs and, and the very vague captions that were written on the back to see if I could piece together his wartime story. So out of all the photographs that were sent to me from Sicily, from Russia, from Italy, from North Africa, it was the photograph I've got now is the one that intrigued me the most. So in order to um, find some, I had a vague idea of where this particular photograph was taken. Um, but I didn't know when and I didn't know what unit he was in. So my first job was to try and zoom in and, and clear up the, the sort of uh, out of focus background where the grave markers are, because that might give me a clue. And eventually I did after a bit of tweaking and I found out that his unit or not his unit, which I didn't know which company he was in, but he was in the, the Falsham Panzerjäger uh, Abteilung, which is the, 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 the parachute anti-tank unit. Which, which only consisted of three companies. It was slightly smaller than a, than a battalion, but at least I confirmed his unit. It also confirmed it was Crete. I, I had a good idea that it was Crete, but I hadn't yet uh, found out the exact location of where the photograph was taken. I was sent uh, another couple of photographs by a collector who'd seen them on eBay two or three years ago, which confirmed it, it, was, it was another set of photographs to, and it's a, uh, an award ceremony stroke memorial ceremony for the men who are buried behind. So you can see in the photograph that uh, both men, Werner Eichler is the man on the left. The guy on the right, the photograph, I still haven't been able to identify, unfortunately, but you can see that both of them have, have just been awarded the Iron Cross second class for their part in the Battle of Crete, which of course started on the, the 20th of May. But this particular unit that Werner Eichler was a member of, didn't jump into Crete until the 21st, the morning of the 21st, as reinforcements for the beleaguered German powers who jumped the day before. 
And this got my interest up in this unit because it's always overlooked in books. Historians always sort of focus on the main regiments that took part in the invasion. And they often forget the, the smaller divisional units and the core units that, uh, that jump with them. So we know, I know that the stab, the, you know, the staff, the first and the third company jumped in on the 21st. I still didn't know what uh, company he was in. And then the Bundesarchive wrote back to me and it confirmed that he was in the third company. He, he had been um, in the army beforehand. And if you look at the photograph, one of the, one of the interesting aspects or two interesting aspects of the photographs is Werner Eichler, who I said is on the left, is wearing an army belt buckle. So I only by chance saw it, zoomed in on it and realized it was an army belt buckle as opposed to the other guy who's wearing a Luftwaffe belt buckle. And it was only because his records came back. He was a member of a, 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 an ersatz, uh, infantry ersatz regiment in the 14th company, which was Panzerjäger. So he'd, he'd been a Panzerjäger already and, and continued to wear his army belt buckle. So I told his daughter this and, and funnily enough, her brother still got it. The brother still got the belt buckle. He, he managed to keep hold of it through his POW days. He joined uh, the airborne troops in September 1940. So he had done all his training and joined this anti-tank unit. The other interesting um, part of that photograph, if you look at the other guy, the, the unnamed guy, just above his, the breast eagle on his jump smock is a button. And that intrigued me because I'd never seen a button before on, on a uniform just above the breast. And I was lucky enough to be sent from Germany some documents and, and one of them was dress regulations for this particular unit that was written by their commander, Hauptmann Alga Schmitz, who was a bit of a stickler for regulations. And one of his last regulations was that every man will sew a button one centimetre above the breast eagle, and that was to hang the uh, issued torch on. So only when I found this out and I saw another picture of Panzer Jaeger in Crete did I notice that the majority of men had buttons sewn above the breast eagle on their, on their jump spots. Obviously, Werner's had fallen off somewhere and I lost it. So as for the place, I, I managed to a to bit, bit more digging and I found that the place where they are with the building in the background is quite possibly Gorani, which is up in, on the northwest coast of Crete between Malame and Platanius. And the date, I believe it's the 2nd of June, 1941, the, the date of this award ceremony and this memorial service. So it was quite interesting to be able to, from one photograph with no caption at all, to build up a picture and be able to captionize it. And with all the other information I've gathered about him and particularly his company, because I don't have any more personal anecdotes from him. So I've only been able to build up a picture of his company because he stayed with the same one from 1940 until he was captured on the 18th of May, 44. So I've been able to write a quite a long document, a sort of history of his unit, where he went from Sicily, Crete, Russia, um, and prepare it for the family. But of course, on, on the other hand, on the, the, the front of my book features two of his um, photographs. Some of his photographs appear throughout the book. And of course, on the back cover is the same photograph which I thought was quite a good uh, photograph to put on the, the back cover. But for me, th this photograph, you know, it's a snapshot in time. It's, it's a snapshot of an event that happened that nobody knew about. But now, you know, through a bit of digging, I've been able to clarify and, and gain a caption for it. So what you've just shared with us there, Greg, is really exactly what I want to do with these little short programs, is demonstrate how people like yourself, historians and writers, use the various resources of archives and family testimonies and photo albums and and put together stories and what we can do on youtube of course we can zoom in on that photo you know the books are brilliant but you can't zoom in on a photo in a book you can only use it with a magnifying glass but you know as we're we're talking you we, we've moved around the photo and had a look at it and it's those little details the button if that photo had been two inches across in a tiny magazine article i'd have never have seen that button it needs that time to look at it and examine it and yeah, there's unlimited details in his photos, so it's extraordinary. And thank you very much for sharing that with us, Greg. And we will we will have you on again to do some other photos, I think, because that's really well done. So, uh, Greg, anything else about the uniforms there and the smocks they're wearing or the pattern of helmet that it also helps identify the era? Yeah, the M38 helmet, which was quite uh, common then uh, at that point of the war, you could see that the, the sizes... I'm, I'm not an expert on helmets, but I know that you can... Uh, 
you can either get one too large or too small for your head. And it seems as though they should have swapped them. Swap. Uh, yeah, definitely. At some yeah. Point. And the the step in smock with the uh, you can see the the zippers the uh, and the, and the tabs coming out of the the zippers, plenty of pockets to stuff with ammunition and grenades and and food. A lot of a lot of the uh, paratroopers because of the heat in that in Crete, you know, a lot of veterans told me that the, the heat thirty eight degrees plus in uh, in the daytime from the twentieth of May onwards while they were there, and a lot of them discarded their flieger blues their their flying jackets from underneath the 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 jump smock and just wore the jump smock on top yeah so cut the bottoms of the trousers off and, and of course you see a lot of photographs later on in, in the battle after the battle where the germans are using captured british and commonwealth uh, tropical clothing shorts and shirts and pith helmets because the, their own uniforms were the same ones they jumped into narvik so that was a really cool little episode of Conflict on Camera. And again, I urge anybody who's watching this, if you're an amateur historian or, or a published historian or an, an author, and you've got a photo you want to talk about, drop us a line, contact us on Twitter and Facebook or via, via our website, and you can come on and discuss a photo. And we'll, we'll put your photo on the, uh, on the screen and, just, and talk about it. So don't forget to check out our, our Patreon page, check out our um, Twitter and Facebook accounts. And as I say below, there's information to Greg's uh, book in the description on youtube below so thank you very much for watching everybody thank you greg for joining us and we will see you all again on conflict on camera very soon thank you very much